everybody. My name is Jeff. And I am a sinner saved by grace. Amen. Yes. That's not for me. That's for grace, right? So, yeah, I'm a sinner. But I'm not as bad as a couple of pastors I know. <laughs> Believe it or not, this may come as a little shocking, but um, I know of two pastors that um, they go to uh, porn conventions and they hang out with porn stars, which, you know, is weird. Right? It's weird. So um, they, they go to these places. They hang out with, with these people. Um, and I'm not talking about outside, you know, like shouting and placards and so forth. I'm talking about they go inside. They buy tickets and they hang out with these folks. And, you know, they have no business being there. Or do they? Right? They believe that that industry, that sex industry, damages everybody involved. And they talk about that and they have research to show um, what that industry is really all about. Multi-billion dollar industry. But they also go in and express love and compassion, particularly for the women who are exploited in those films. And let them know that Jesus loves them. In fact, they created a ministry called Jesus Loves Porn Stars. And it's a, it's a ministry of now a number of people from around the country um, who minister in that way. They also started an online uh, thing, triplexchurch.com. Uh, and uh, it's information about the industry. It's a accountability thing for people who struggle with pornography to, uh, to help them in their struggle. And, uh, but it's two pastors that started that. So here's a question that I bet you haven't ever been asked. Do you think Jesus would hang out with porn stars? So we're in this series right now that we're calling He's That Guy. And in this series, what we're, what we're doing, you know, is the, kind of the, the theme of this series is that Jesus was that guy that you don't want to be. Right? Because that's what that phrase is about, right? He's that guy. When somebody says he's that guy, they're talking about a guy who's doing something that is obnoxious or weird or um, out of the norm, and you don't want to be that guy. And so there's a whole lot of stuff that Jesus did in his time, 2,000 years ago, that had people, particularly the religious people of the day, looking at him and going, ugh, he's that guy. He's that guy. This morning, as we look at another example of Jesus being that guy, we're looking at the fact that Jesus tended to hang around with all the wrong people. Jesus had this tendency of hanging around with all the wrong people. And people didn't, you know, the good people, the religious people, looked at that and went, what is he doing? Why is he that guy? I mean, the people that Jesus hung out with included prostitutes and adulterers and traitors to the country. He hung out with handicapped people. Now, you've got to understand that in that time, somebody who was 
physically handicapped in any way, whether they were blind or lame in some way or deformed physically in some way, the belief among the religious people was that the reason for that is that God was angry either at that person or at that person's parents. And so this was kind of God's retribution. And so most people, you know, you didn't hang out with lame people. That's why anytime you see somebody in the New Testament who is blind or lame, they are by themselves begging for money because nobody wanted to be with them. Jesus hung out with handicapped people. Jesus hung out with women. Women in, the, in this first century were viewed as basically property, right? Owned by men. Not independent, not people that you dealt with, particularly if you're a religious leader, you know, you didn't, uh, male, you didn't speak with women, and Jesus did. Jesus elevated women to an equal status. They were part of his inner circle, they were part of his ministry. Jesus hung out with women. Jesus hung out with the hated Samaritans. The Samaritans of this day were people who had perverted the Jewish faith. They had uh, combined it with cultic practices of other religions in the area. And Jews could not stand, a faithful Jew could not stand a Samaritan, and yet Jesus seemed to enjoy their company. Jesus had this bad habit of hanging out with the wrong people. One of the things that they would say of Jesus is he seemed to be more comfortable with sinners than with saints. And it affected his reputation among the good people. He was that guy who hung out with all the wrong people. So in looking at that, I want to check out with you a passage from the Gospel of Mark. In the Gospel of Mark, we have this really profound story. And uh, so I just want to kind of read through it and, uh, and go through it with you. Huh? I don't know what that is. It's tape, and it keeps sticking to me, so sorry. <laughs> All right, so it's uh, Mark, the second chapter, and uh, you can follow along. The words will be on the screen. This is what it says. As he, meaning Jesus, as Jesus walked along, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at his tax collector's booth. Now, I'm going to pause there for just a second. Levi is a tax collector, and, you know, some of you are familiar with the reason the tax collectors were so unpopular more than any other, you know, we, they're not popular today either, but for a whole different reason back then. A tax collector back in the first century was in essence a mob boss, right? So their job was to collect taxes for Rome, but many of these tax collectors also would collect more than they were supposed to collect for Rome. And so they would extort more money, they would take more money from people um, than they were supposed to. And they had the full backing. The difference between a tax collector and a mafia guy was the tax collector had the support of the government behind them. They had the law of Rome and they had the law enforcement power of Rome backing them up. So you were powerless to do anything to protect yourself from these unscrupulous tax collectors. And so they're literally bleeding people of their income, of their resources, of their supplies and so forth. They were hated for this reason. So they were viewed as thieves and extortionists, traitors, because the tax collectors in the Palestine area were mostly Jews. And so they were aiding and abetting the enemy. So they were traitors. So when it talks about tax collectors, it is the worst kind of person. Levi was a tax collector. 
sitting there at his tax collector booth. Jesus walks up and says, follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up and followed him. What are you doing, Jesus? Right? Really? A tax collector? Follow me? And Levi got up and followed him. Later, Levi invited Jesus and his disciples to come to his home as dinner guests, along with many other tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. There were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. I love this little sentence because it's so rich, right? So sometime after Levi decides to follow Jesus, sometime after that, we don't know, was it days or weeks or months later, but at some point, Levi says, hey, I'm having a party at my house, Jesus, and I'd like you and the boys to come and join me and my friends for a party. So if you're a tax collector, who do you think your friends are? Right? Other tax collectors, right? Because they get you and it's like a little club and, you know, I'm sure they're trading professional tips, you know, about how, how to get more from the people that you're taking money from and so forth. So they're hanging out with those guys. And then this description of and other disreputable sinners, this basket full of disreputable people, right? All the wrong people. And you can only imagine, you can just imagine what kinds of people would be included in this gathering, right? So if it's a mob type of group, these tax collectors, who are they hanging out with? Yeah, all the wrong people, right? Nobody that your mom would want you hanging out with, right? That's who's at this party. And Jesus goes, and he's hanging out with these folks. Now, it would be one thing if Jesus went into this setting and began to call them out. Tell them how disreputable they were, what terrible sinners that they were to turn or burn. You know, if, if it were that kind of thing, then maybe we could understand it. But he seems to just be there. Hmm. So, verse 16. But when the teachers of religious law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating among the tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with such scum? Subtle. Right? But it's a great question. Why is he doing that? What? Why? And I think implied in the question, right, is some assumptions. Why is he doing that? He must, one, either be ignorant of who they are. Maybe Jesus isn't very bright, and he doesn't get who's in that house. Or, maybe he doesn't care. Maybe he likes those people. Maybe he is like those people. Maybe this traveling rabbi isn't all that people think that he is. Why is it that he is eating with
with such scum. <laughs> when Jesus heard this, he said to them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come not to call those who think they are righteous, but those who know that they are sinners. Wow, what a great answer. When Jesus heard this, so, you know, as I was kind of reflecting on this scripture, when Jesus heard this, my first thought was, how did Jesus hear this? So I'm picturing, like, maybe the Pharisees are in the room having this conversation, but there's no way the Pharisees are in that house. So I guess what must have happened is a couple of the disciples went outside, you know, so... Maybe they went out to get a breath of fresh air, or you know, maybe they were sent on a run to get more wine. Who knows? But the couple of disciples must have gone outside, and there's this group of Pharisees there, and they're having a conversation among themselves, and they can see Jesus is in the house. And so they stop the disciples and ask this question. And when the disciples do their whatever it was they were outside to do, go back in, they go, hey, hey, Jesus... There's some Pharisees outside, and they want to know, like, why are we here? What's going on? Why are we? And I wonder if they didn't wonder themselves, you know, the disciples. Why are we here? Why are we with these people? And Jesus goes, oh, you know, I'm like a doctor for sick people. Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. Righteous people, and that's not what he said, right? People who think they're righteous don't need me. I've come for those who know that they're sinners. See, as long as you think you've got it all together with God, as long as you feel like you are righteous, you don't need Jesus. Jesus came for the sinners. Wow. It's powerful. This is why Jesus came. Jesus came for the sinners. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we were looking at the passage about Zacchaeus, another tax collector whose house Jesus was at with other tax collectors and scum. And in that passage, after Zacchaeus declared his faith and made this promise of generosity, Jesus said, I have come to seek and to save the lost. I have come to seek and to save the lost. In John chapter 3, verse 17, it says this, God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. His coming wasn't about bringing judgment and condemnation, but bringing salvation by bringing grace to all. Sometimes I think we are more interested in Jesus condemning than recreating, about shaming more than saving. But Jesus comes into the midst of sinners who know that they're sinners, who acknowledge the fact that they fall short of the glory of God, that acknowledge the fact that they miss the mark. That's what sin is, right? I mean, literally, the word sin means to miss the mark. So as long as you think you are on mark all the time, you've got it. You don't really need Jesus. It's when you acknowledge, when you're aware of the fact that you missed the mark. 
And the Bible is clear that we all miss the mark, all fall short of the glory of God. That we begin to understand that we are them. We are them. We are the sinners. We're the ones who fall short. All of us fall short of the glory of God. So getting that kind of awareness, that understanding that that we or them is really important. See, Jesus again had this ability to see the goodness in bad people and to see the badness in good people. Jesus sees through all of that, right? So when he looked at those people in that room, at that party, I don't think he saw tax collectors and disreputable sinners. I think Jesus saw them as individuals who have stories and lives and broken places and misguided truth and fears and hopes and dreams. He saw them as God's creation with eternal value. And those were the people he came to seek and to save. People just like me. So, Jesus is hanging out with these people. And what about us? How do we view people that are broken, sinful people? People we want to condemn or shame? Or do we see them the way that Jesus sees them? Jesus came into the world to bring hope a better life to show them a better life because you know that's the thing when when you're living a life outside of the kingdom principles it's already a hard life right? you're already, already struggling things are going to go off the rails they don't need people to condemn them or to judge them or to reject them right they're already dealing with the struggles of a life separated from god what a different message to bring them word words of hope and of grace it's unexpected really i mean that's the thing that is so inspiring in some ways to me about a group like the group that started Jesus Loves Porn Stars. It's not what you would expect Christians to do, unfortunately. In fact, I was reading their About Us on their website. Let me just read some, a little bit of this to give you a sense of how they view their ministry. They write this, we believe Jesus meets people where they are. We don't subscribe to the belief system that God only loves those who live the way we or, religious, or religion thinks they should live. We believe that it is when Jesus meets, loves, and accepts us where we are no matter what that place, that we are transformed by that crazy kind of love. We long to live and to love like that. In 2002, our then very small uh, team went into the 
convention to love on both the consumer and the workers that were there. This approach was very different from other religious organizations present outside of uh, present outside of the convention with their posters and megaphones preaching a message of law and hate. Over a decade plus later, our love is just as strong, if not stronger, for those inside the walls of the sex industry. So, where do you think Jesus would be? Would Jesus be out in the parking lot with signs and bullhorns or would Jesus be inside the convention center? I think Mark's story makes it pretty clear. And really, that's where Christians have been. Not all Christians, not all the time, but the most impactful Christians understand this, that if you want to have influence, you have to be a presence. If you want to be an influence, you have to be a presence. As long as we are cloistered in our buildings, cloistered away from the world, safe from the world, we are not an influence. And increasingly, in this age in which we live, where fewer and fewer people um, are going into churches, where we literally now have our second generation of Americans now living who have zero connection to the church or the faith, meaning that they were born to parents who never went to church, weren't baptized as children, didn't go through confirmation, didn't go to Sunday school, don't go to Christmas or Easter services, no connection to the church at all. So what happens inside churches is as foreign to those two generations of Americans as what goes on in a Hindu temple would be to me. The only thing then they know about the faith is what they see and hear on their news feeds, on YouTube, on Netflix. And what do those pictures tell them about who we are? So if we want to be an influence, we have to be a presence. And again, that's what Christians have done for, for a long time. That's why Christians go into prisons, right? Work among prisoners. If they want to be an influence, they have to be a presence. It's why we see Christians who um, are involved in ministering to addicts, people who have addictions to uh, drugs, to alcohol, sex, these places of where people get stuck in addictions. Christians are there. Refugees, stuck in camps, Christians are there to bring a message of Christ's love and acceptance, grace. On and on and on. But you know what? It's not just those people. Because we know that behind the beautifully manicured lawns and brick siding or vinyl siding homes, on wide tree-lined streets behind those walls are broken people, struggling people, people in need of a message of love and grace, a God who knows and cares for them. Those are the people that Jesus loves and cares for.
and as his followers, so should we. See, the thing about that story, right, in, uh, in Mark's gospel, Jesus wasn't in that place by himself. He was there with his disciples. Right? He was modeling for them how to be engaged in the world. I think he was modeling for them how to be engaged in the world. So he was there at that party, and I'm sure that there were times in the conversation where Jesus was sharing about the kingdom of God. I'm sure it's not all that he was talking about, but he talked about that. He was talking to them about who his father was and what the kingdom of God was about. And I am sure a number of them believed and followed Jesus. And I'm sure a bunch of them didn't believe and didn't follow Jesus. But he was a presence and sharing the story in grace-filled ways. So I hope we can throw these kinds of parties, right? Where we bring our Christian friends and our secular friends together in the same place and have a party together right? and share life together and stories together and in the mix of all of that to be comfortable enough to talk about the reality of my faith and maybe for you that might just be that you're saying you know what I, I've been going to a small group at my church and here's something that we're doing in my small group to actually say that out loud and not hold that for, you know, well, I, can, I can't talk about that in this group. That's for a different group, right? It's just, it's just sharing your life with people. And if somebody says, that offends me, don't ever talk to me about that again, okay? All right, doesn't mean I'm not going to be your friend anymore, but maybe there'll be another opportunity, another occasion. Anyway. We also have a church that says we accept people where they are, as they are, for who they are. That's who we are. We accept people as they are, who they are, where they are. Invite them in. And invite them into a relationship with Christ. At their own pace, in their own time. All the while being loved and accepted by the people of this community of faith. You see, Jesus didn't hang out with all the wrong people. Jesus hung out with people and brought them good news, transforming news that is a blessing to all who receive it. Amen? Let's stand together. So, Lord, thank you. Thank you for loving a sinner like me. Thank you for accepting me for who I am, as I am, where I am. And inviting me to be part of an adventure in your kingdom. And I thank you for the ways that you have blessed and guided me. Each of us in this room, Lord, are in different places in our faith and in our journey, and each of us is grateful for who you are and for who we are because of you. And so we give you our praise and our thanks, our glory and our honor, and it's our desire to walk in your footsteps. So as we seek to be an influence be salt and light. Remind us that we need to be a presence, not of condemnation or rejection, but of grace and of love. In the name of Jesus, who loves us, amen. Have a great week.